And welcome to the program. You know, we look at news, views, truths from a decidedly biblical perspective. And who ever thought that the world's leading free nation, quite frankly, because of the calling of God and the blessing of God, would have a political party who wants to delete God? And make no mistake, that is what the progressive left wants to do. We'll talk about this and much more this hour. Are we looking at another Mideast war with Iran in the picture? Doesn't the Bible predict a major end-time conflict with a nation called Persia? Includes other nations, such as Russia and Turkey. I have worked with White House correspondent Bill Koenig since 2002. He has been a frequent guest at my Understanding the Times conferences. He has his finger on the pulse of what's happening, not just in America, but around the world, and particularly the Middle East, which we often call the epicenter of all things that are going on. Bill, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jen. Always a pleasure to be with you. I think America recently is divided into two categories, and you actually write about this. People who fear God versus people who hate God, and the progressive left can think of only one thing, dethroning God so that government can be God. And, you know, you've been in Washington 20 years, and you've seen this evolve, am I right? Absolutely. It is absolutely amazing how fast things have accelerated over the last, the eight years of Obama, and then since Obama and and President Trump taking over With his evangelical support, it seems like the enemy wants to do everything they can to attack the evangelical enemy that supports President Trump, and this is all part of it, Jan. But yeah, this slippery slope has been getting worse and worse and worse over time, and now it's at an accelerated pace, just as that clip just mentioned. It Mm -hmm. is unbelievable, what we just heard. Yeah, it is unbelievable in its speed as well. And you and I are frank, Bill, that we have a president who God uses in spite of himself. And one of the things that makes him unique, we've already referenced it, is he's so comfortable with evangelical Christians. They elected him in 2016. And as you write, George W. Bush seemed more comfortable with, say, mainline Protestants and perhaps Catholics. Barack Obama was comfortable with leftist so-called Christians. I have a hard time equating communist Jim Wallace with Christianity, but that's what he calls himself anyway. There certainly are some evangelicals in the leftist camp. you got Russell Moore, who's a leftist, for that matter. The last 20 years, the National Association of Evangelicals just go to their website. It's all leftist policy. Thankfully, they're standing for traditional marriage and are anti-abortion. But Donald Trump resonates heavily with evangelicals. He has unprecedented number of evangelicals serving with him. He has a burden for Christian persecution, how rare, and he's been Israel's best friend ever. It's remarkable. I know a lot of members of the advisor committee, and you do too, Jan, mm-hmm. and they are devout and strong Christians. Pastor Jeffers, Franklin Graham's not part of the advisor committee, but he has good rapport there with the president, Michelle Bachman. These are people that love the Lord, love Jesus, very bold about their faith. And these are people that President Trump feels very, very comfortable with. I was a part of the thousand Christian leaders that were at the Marriott Marquis just yeah. before the election in mm-hmm. 2016. You and I saw an amazing event. This was so amazing. And President Trump was so comfortable. And Mike Huckabee interviewed him. Franklin Graham was there. Jim Dobson. A wide group of people from the Christian community were there. I've been in numerous audiences with him, and he's very comfortable with us. He looks to us. He fears God. He has his own unique style and his own unique way of communicating. But the work that they're doing through the State Department, through Mike Pence, Sam Brownback now, about Christian persecution. Mike Pence is very outspoken about Christian persecution and also about the right to life. This is just an incredible Mm -hmm. group of people that he has around him that can make things happen and that he listens to. I don't think a lot of people realize that, Jan. He feels very comfortable with us. And as you mentioned, President Bush was very comfortable with the Protestants and and many of the Catholic leaders that were at the White House. Fortunately, Obama bashed Christians, especially the ones who were very evangelical. This is just a breath of fresh air, despite the challenges that we're going through here in Washington. And you have said to me, and I think you wrote it in your newsletter as well, and that is you said that the progressive left, the party of the left, is going to run America into the ground if necessary to remove President Trump. And you've written that the left will not govern as long as President Trump is in office. I think they're only going to object and holler and scream impeachment. It's almost a demonic obsession. Am I wrong? No, absolutely. This is an obsession they are out of control with. Yeah. I mean, 
We hear the Trump derangement syndrome, and we've watched it with these committee heads, these Democratic committee heads in Congress, just their behavior, Nadler, Waters, Cummings, Mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they can't contain themselves. And they certainly don't want to see President Trump be successful at anything. He's getting a lot accomplished, as he mentioned in his re-election campaign or beginning in Orlando. People that follow your program, our website, President Trump's accomplished a lot and it has not been easy. Plus, with this Mueller thing hanging over his shoulder, yep. he's getting a lot accomplished. He could get much more accomplished. And that's one thing that this Democratic-led House of Representatives, they don't want to see him get credit for anything. And they're making his life difficult and Unfortunately, it's putting their own obsessions and issues ahead of the the American public. Right. And that's unfortunate. If I could offer my two cents on all of this, and that would be that President Trump said something. He said this in a recent campaign speech, and that is that the party of the left is not so obsessed with him, though it certainly is, but he said it's equally obsessed with every conservative, patriotic, God-fearing, church-attending person in America, probably the Western world, that their goal is to wipe out, I think, this is my opinion, their goal is to wipe out every person who does not embrace a radical agenda, LGBTQ, heavily this transgender nonsense, use any bathroom you want, destroy every unplanned baby, let every boy participate in women's sports, dictate what can be spoken from every church pulpit. These are the people, if we oppose any of this, that are in the crosshairs just as much as the president is in. And this is why pro-family leaders and other Christian leaders are warning that no one who embraces faith and traditional values is now safe in America or anywhere else. Certainly, I mean, look at Canada. They're not safe there either. I think they may be ahead of America. And my conclusion, Bill Koenig, is that we're in an Isaiah 520 generation, a 2 Timothy 3 generation. Right now, evil is celebrating. Righteousness exists only to be attacked. And if you love your country, you're an aberration that must be driven underground and laws passed to silence you. And I have a frequent saying, I never thought I'd see the day, and I never thought I'd see this day. No, absolutely, Jan. I think about that every once in a while. At my age and the things I've experienced over life, I would have never thought at my age, at this time, having been away from high school, college, after college, business world, Mm -hmm. ministry, that I would ever see anything remotely like this. It's just unconscionable. And even if someone, let's say someone was off this planet for the last 10 and a half years, and if they came back right now, they would not even believe what's taking place. You know, it all built to a point and then it accelerated. It became an avalanche. It's so hard to even comprehend this kind of behavior. The other thing is if they can't defeat the people of Mm -hmm. faith, they're going to infiltrate the liberal churches with their dogma, with their agenda, with their talk, with this hate speech stuff, with their pro-LGBTQ, with their pro-gay marriage. They're going to do it that way. And they are infiltrating the Protestant and Catholic churches, which now, unfortunately now a majority of them favor same-sex marriage. Yeah, you're right. It's unbelievable. I think evangelicals is maybe 30% yeah. right now. That's up from 20 and that's what's happening. And you've seen it. I've seen it. Oh, denominations I never thought would cave have caved. I want to play Absolutely. just a quick clip here. It's Franklin Graham, and he's talking to Laura Ingram, basically saying, you know what? We need more Christians in leadership in Washington. I thought the president today was, I thought he was mesmerizing. And I, I mean, Donald Trump is the guy who's holding the torch for God and Christianity uh, and Judeo-Christian culture. Uh, it's, it's stunning. It, it is stunning, and I, I don't, uh, in my lifetime, we've never had a president like this, and uh, he's not afraid to speak out about his faith, but this was the, the 66th uh, prayer breakfast, uh, and it started, uh, my father encouraged um, going back to President Eisenhower, uh, and others uh, worked on this at the very beginning, and every president since Eisenhower has come to this breakfast, and it is a bipartisan breakfast put on by Republicans and Democrats, and they, they work together, and these are men uh, and women of faith who come together in a bipartisan way uh, to put on this breakfast. And it shows you that Washington can function, and we need Lord, more Christians in Washington. We need more. Could you imagine if the majority of, of the House and Senate were, were God-fearing men and women, that uh, they could argue their points, but at the end of the day, they would come together and, and work for the good of, of the all-American people. We need men and women in Washington who believe in God, who believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, who took our sins to the cross, who died for our sins, who God raised uh, to life. We need more men and women like this. And last year, I went across this country to every state capital, 
asking people to pray for this country and encouraging Christians to run. And I didn't tell them what party to run for. They could be Democrats, they could be Republicans, but we need Christians at every level of government. And when Christians come together, this is what you see at the prayer breakfast. They come together and they work together. It was a great thing, Laura. I was glad to be there. At one, at one point, the president talked about uh, how uh, a year earlier he had asked for prayers uh, for, uh, I believe it was a little girl uh, who was very, very ill. And he said he was, you know, as he was overwhelmed. I heard from others he had been overwhelmed by the response, the prayer that had come in for her. And he reported that, you know, she was doing much better. That was just a small, small moment. But I know I personally, I, I felt the power of prayer in very difficult times. And the left doesn't understand this, Franklin, because they say, well, look, he's been married all these times. And look, he, you know, he can have a foul mouth. He said these things in the past. How can this flawed man be this evangelical and, and, and Catholic uh, you know, uh, a leader in a way? I mean, how, how does that happen? How does God use people like that? And your response would be? <laughs> Well, you, you know, uh, Donald Trump is not a perfect person. And I'm certainly, uh, I'm not a perfect person. And I would hate for somebody to hold me up as being the, uh, the greatest example of the Christian faith or the Christian life. Uh, I'm, I've got many failures in my life, and so does Donald Trump. But that doesn't stop me from believing in God and, and believing in his son, Jesus Christ. And Donald Trump believes in God. And he believes in uh, God's son, Jesus Christ. And I appreciate the fact that he doesn't run away from his faith. And he's willing to stand up in front of the whole world and let the world know where he stands. And he appreciates people praying for him. Yeah. We need to pray. You know, we're commanded to pray for all those that are in authority, Lord, all of them. Whether, when Donald yeah, Trump sure uh, won the presidency, he became my president and your president. And we need, yeah. God orders us to pray for him. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here. I have on the line from Washington, Bill Koenig. I've worked with Bill since 2002. You can learn a lot more at his website, which is watch.org, watch as in watchman, watch.org. And you can sign up for his weekly e-newsletter, which I think I've promoted for maybe 10, 12 years now, Koenig's Eye View from the White House. It's electronic. You have to get it at watch.org. A quick word here about my annual conference coming up September 21st. Tickets are going fast. You need to check my website or just call Brush Fire Ticketing. That's 888-338-5338. 888-338-5338. September 21st. Tickets are $25. Include a lunch. J.D. Farag, Robert Jeffress, Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, yours truly, and Lori Cardoza Moore as well. At least she'll be bringing us a reading that afternoon. Please don't wait until it's too late. Get those tickets at brushfire.com or 888-338-5338. I want to move on here with Bill Koenig and Bill, you and I, and talking privately. We are so concerned about the tide of our times and the, just for an example, and you write about it, Disney, Netflix threatening to leave Georgia in spite of the fact that Hollywood actually films in countries that ban abortion, but Hollywood and corporate America are threatening state boycotts, again, over this LGBTQ abortion restrictions. And there are a few Fortune 500 companies in America that seem to have the moral commitment to oppose this because of the wrath that would come their way by the media, etc. Again, we get back to this Isaiah 520, letting eight-year-old girls have hormone injections. That's good. It's incredible to watch this. I think you're just spellbound. I have a lot of friends in Texas. I lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for 22 years. And I have friends in the government down there and also people that help support that government. And uh, what they're going through down there is incredible. And I tell you, Texans will stand up to this. It's been a battle of an incredible size and magnitude. Texas, the state, continues to get blessed with enormous oil and gas resources and just incredible economy. And the cities are booming. And at the same time, they're in a constant battle against corporate America, against the NFL. One time, you know, other sports leagues were threatening to take the All-Star game out, the Super Bowl game out. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Just on a bathroom bill. I mean, look what North Carolina went through. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, incredible. But praise God for the boldness in these leaders in these states that are doing the right thing, biblically speaking. They stand up for life. They stand up for marriage, a man and woman, as it was designed for. They take on these corporate powerhouses that are in there looking for deals anyhow. A lot of times they get so many big tax breaks. The taxpayers end up paying for it, and the shareholders of these large corporations are the ones that benefit, not the people outside of the jobs. This is a slippery slope, Jan. It's not getting better. Unfortunately, it's getting it worse. You know, anytime you say anything about this, it's considered uh, hate, hate speech. speech. Yeah. 
on and on and on. And unfortunately, these activists have worked their way into human relations in major corporations. They've worked their way into public relations departments. Obama and Kerry had 250 LGBT activists within their administration. And a lot of these people are now working for corporate America. It's just another facet of, I can't believe this is happening, yeah. but well, unfortunately it is. And one of these days, I think, just like in Noah's day, God said enough. I think he's going to say enough here any day as well. He's going to, re- oh, yes. he's going to remove the church in what's called the rapture of the church. He's going to leave evil mankind on their own, take the church home. And I want to read just two paragraphs from your associate, Bill Wilson, because I'm not quite finished with Washington yet. Bill Koenig has been working out of Washington for 20 years. He serves in the White House Press Corps, which that in itself is a challenge since most of those are on the far left. And once we get to talking about the media, we learn that 90 to probably even 95 percent of the media is hard left. But here's what Bill Wilson writes, and he's one of the writers for Bill Koenig. And Bill says this. I'm only reading two paragraphs. I'll do it real quickly here. He says, three players in the Russian influence con were former FBI Director James Comey, former CIA Director John Brennan, and former National Intelligence Director James Clapper. They are all master manipulators, deep state intel veterans. Comey, Brennan, and Clapper were appointed by Barack Obama. All three also were connected to the George W. Bush administration. Recall that after the 2016 election, the New York Post reported that the outgoing president was establishing a shadow government to maintain power through a series of nonprofits, government insiders, and appointed judges in the court system. Most know that these three actors were intimately involved in trying to take down the newly elected president. What you may not have known is the shocking revelation of these perilous times. And then the last paragraph I'm reading by Bill Wilson, who writes for Koenig's International News. He says, Washington Times columnist Robert Knight and author Diana West have revealed a legitimate communist concern surrounding these men. Knight reports that West, in her book, The Red Thread, documents that Brennan and Comey are communists. West documents Brennan's September 16, 2016, admission of voting for the Communist Party in 1976, that's in the U.S., during testimony before the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Knight reports that Comey admitted identifying as a communist when he was a young man and still reveres Marxist theologian Reinhold Niebuhr as his spiritual lodestar. Clapper told the House Intelligence Committee in 2011 that the terrorist sponsoring Muslim Brotherhood was just secular and that it had no overarching agenda. So, Bill, and this is written by Bill Wilson, one of your colleagues, actually Curtis Bowers referenced this as well, but I think your average person has no idea that the person leading this bogus campaign against the president, James Comey, background as a communist. Maybe he is still today. I don't know. That's what's interesting. Bill did a great job there of pulling that out with from very, very credible sources as well as his own insight, which is excellent. What's happening, and I think that's part of the reason the Dems have come against Trump so harshly and hard is because they're doing everything they can to continue with their attack because this stuff is going to surface. I mean, it's beginning to surface. Attorney General Barr and some of the people he's put in place and some of the other reports are going to be coming soon. And the U.S. attorney from Connecticut that's in charge of the investigation. I mean, he's bringing an A-team in of guys that are going to get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. So those people you mentioned, a lot of this is going to be exposed. Uh, hopefully a lot. And I think that's really the number one motivation of the Democratic Party to continue through their media, which they control 90, 95 percent of the media, well, to keep the attack on Trump on the front page of the newspaper where this other stuff just won't get the press and coverage and light that it deserves. I want to transition into the media. And you're certainly a member of the media. And you've told me 90 percent at least our hardcore left. I'd certainly like to know what's in the drinking water at these journalism schools that they crank out one Marxist after another, after another, anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-righteousness, anti-flag, anti-patriotism. That's what they're cranking out in these journalism schools. I just want to play a clip here. It's Mark Levin. And then I want to address you, Bill, on the media. I want to quote you as well out of your newsletter, because I think you've written some brilliant paragraphs here. But here, Mark Levin, in his new book about the media, he says, look, free press is destroyed. You and I and my listening audience is an enemy of the press. More Americans are worried about fake news than terrorism. That's the part of this clip you may not hear. That's kind of a lead in before we get to Mark's comments. More Americans are worried about fake news than they are terrorism. Just about everybody I know has turned television off because it's intolerable. Let's just play that clip. Great one. First of all, there's a reason all your books go to number one, because they're full of substance. And I read it cover to cover, 
and I read your book, I look at this Pew Research poll, and I look at a president that has taken on this corrupt media and two year plus years of lying conspiracies and a hoax, how could anyone trust them? Well, you know, Sean, uh, I'll tell you why I wrote this book, because the media won't self-police. There's no circumspection. There's no reconsideration. There's no shame. Uh, and there are really no standards left. So it's up to we, the people, to take a look at the media, since the media won't look at, each, uh, at themselves. That wasn't always the case. I wrote down a few things here, problems with most of the mass media today. Notice I don't call them the free press because they don't even understand what a free press is supposed to be or the history of a press, because they're destroying a free press. They commingle news and opinion, pseudo-events. They manufacture events. We spent three days talking about the word nasty. How preposterous. They push propaganda for the progressive ideology. AOC is famous not because she's smart, not because she's profound, not because she's accomplished anything, but because they want to promote her and her agenda. Social activism, climate change. Is there any individual at CNN or MSNBC in their newsrooms who don't push climate change? There's no diversity of intellectual thought in these newsrooms, none. They've abandoned the pursuit of objectivity for social activism, progressivism, and the Democrat Party agenda. And they promote that agenda day in and day out. In fact, they lead it. The reason we talk about impeachment today is not because the president committed any impeachable offenses. It's because the media and the Democrat Party want to remove him. The reason we spent two and a half years talking about collusion with Russia, a manufactured story, a pseudo fake event, as the president calls it, not because there was any evidence, but because this is what the media was pushing day in and day out. They are not defending the right on the First Amendment of freedom of the press. What is the purpose of freedom of the press? Why is it in the First Amendment? It's not in the First Amendment because of CNN or MSNBC or their corporate ownership or any specific so-called journalist. It's in there for the American people. Now, why do we have freedom of the press? We have freedom of the press to expand freedom of speech among the American people. The point of news and newsrooms is to give us the information through which we can make decisions about our families, our lives, our government, our country, so we can be informed. The best place to find it right now is local TV news. You're not going to find it in the vast majority of news operations at the national level. But Mark, wait, wait, wait. I disagree. Yeah. You, you get yeah. it right. Rush gets it right. I get it right. Every news, every single newsroom in America fell for the lies, the conspiracies, and the hoaxes. You know, we have Ed Henry and Catherine Herridge. But, Sean, I but said the, yeah. newsrooms, newsrooms, not talk radio, not Got opinion it. shows. And they look down on all of us. And the funny thing is, they're as much opinion as the rest of us. The difference is we're transparent. We tell people who we are. We don't pretend to be something that we're not. These people who are reporters today, not all of them, there's some exceptions, but unfortunately, the general rule, they don't understand the history of freedom of the press. They don't even understand the value of freedom of the press. Most of them are narcissistic. Most of them uh, draw attention to themselves, want to draw attention to themselves. I can go down the list, Acosta and so forth. That's not news. That's not serving the American people. That's not freedom of the press. So the point I want to make to you is this. The president of the United States is their target right now. But overall, it's the American people. The difference between the patriot press was they wanted to fundamentally transform government. The press today wants to fundamentally protect it. They're the Praetorian Guard of big government. And if you're somebody from the outside and you want to challenge it, if you're somebody from the outside and you want to limit it, cut it, rearrange it, you're the enemy of the press. And then Rush Limbaugh says, objective journalism is dead. Today's leftist news media are activist hacks working relentlessly to destroy conservatism, to literally eliminate it and the people who live and believe in it. Everywhere they can, they want to bury it and us. Bill, we probably have to get to this on the other side of my break in a minute, and then let's pick it up again. How did the media deteriorate to this? Mark did a great job in his book, and I uh, mentioned a couple things he mentioned, and just the other thing on our side is secular humanism. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a secular humanistic, human manifesto type approach. We want to remove God. We want to remove Judeo-Christian values. We have our own set of values. 
we need to take care of these people that can't take care of themselves. And then when you have no moral foundation, then all the other perverse things slip into a life, an agenda, and a lifestyle. It affects everything. Think of what it was like when we were growing up, Pledge of Allegiance before yes. school, school prayer before we started school. We didn't have problems in schools. We didn't have problems in our communities. We didn't have problems in our homes. Over time, it's manifested into this disease and now this national disease that we have. And those people, unfortunately, the media in the Democratic Party are in lockstep. That's about 90%. I'm having trouble finding the 10% conservatives, but it's about 90, 95%, somewhere in that range, Jan. But this is a formidable foe. The old saying is you don't want to argue with someone that buys their ink by the gallon. Trump has taken them on, and thank God for Twitter yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. other social networks. Otherwise, this wouldn't be getting out at all. Fox is about the only source. I want to quote you. We'll have to do it on the other side. I've got to take a midpoint in the program break here. When I get back, I want to quote you on what you've written about the media, because I think it sums it up, and you're even questioning what on earth is going on with Fox News, and so am I. I've turned right. them off the last year or so. I also want to get into another topic when we get back, and that is, you and I have said many times that we're in an age, perhaps the most significant breaking news ever, as it relates to issues of the last days, with the least amount of interest in this topic. Why? And why the mocking and the scoffing about the good news that the king is coming? We'll get to that, folks, when I come back in just a minute. Don't go away. We love hearing from you. If we have impacted your life, write us through a website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. You can reach us by mail by writing Jan Markell and Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. More with Jan and Bill in a moment. It is now on the horizon. Understanding the Times 2019, Saturday, September 21st. Tickets will go on sale June 1st. They are general admission only and are $25, but include a lunch. After June 1st, we're asking that you call the Brush Fire Agency at 888-338-5338 or sign up online at brushfire.com. That number again is 888-338-5338 after June 1st. We're featuring six speakers and we begin at 8.45 a.m. Church doors open at 7 a.m. And the location is again Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. Consult our website for hotel information. Our speakers include Dr. Robert Jeffress. These signs that have been around for a long time, they are increasing in frequency and intensity. I think something big's about to happen. Yeah, I believe I we're too. in the last days. I believe the Lord is going to return. Amir Sarfati. And at the last trumpet, we're going to be out of here. There will be certain events around the world, and there will be the last trumpet, and we don't know the day, and we don't know the hour, but we understand the times and the seasons. Pastor J.D. Farag. Because there's coming a time, and I believe it's very soon, when that trumpet's going to sound, and everything here matters no more. I mean, shouldn't that affect us, the way we live our lives? Pastor Jack Hibbs. And he's not only spoken to us in his word, he is speaking to us right now in world events. He's requiring you and I to take what we're seeing in the world and match it up against the Word of God. And Jan Markell. I believe that the world is longing for a man with a plan, for a Mr. Fix-It. It says down at the bottom of here, is there a leader who can stop the chaos? We will also have a greeting from Lori Cardoza Moore from Proclaiming Justice to the Nations. The event will be live streamed at no cost. Again, that's Saturday, September 21, just outside of Minneapolis. We invite all remnant believers to better understand the times and become watchmen on the wall. Make friends for life at this annual conference. Learn why things aren't falling apart, they are falling into place. Only 
Certainly the God of Israel knows how things are going to play out in the Middle East, but fortunately for the United States, we have a team in place as well as at the Pentagon that fully understands the number one threat to the Middle East and to the world, actually, the nation of Iran. If you are on the run, download the OnePlace.com mobile app and find a new program on your device every Saturday morning. Programming is also posted to our YouTube channel under Jan Markell, to our website, and to oneplace.com Saturday morning. Please pray for this radio outreach that travels around the world weekly. We air on almost 850 radio stations, as well as our podcasting and YouTube audience. We are trying to affect lives for eternity. Now back to Jan and Bill Koenig. Could it be that, that President Trump right now has been sort of raised for such a time as this, just like Queen Esther, to help save the Jewish people from an Iranian menace? As a Christian, I, I certainly believe that's possible. And he's talking about God when it comes to Israel. I am confident that the Lord is at work here. Pompeo also receives criticism for injecting his faith into the equation. Uh, oh God, our Father, thou searcher of men's hearts, help us to draw near to thee in sincerity and truth. May our religion be filled with gladness and may our worship of thee be natural. There is nothing wrong with a cabinet official, a government official, when asked to talk about their own personal belief system. What is wrong is for him to apply, as he appeared to do, those Christian values, those specifically evangelical Christian values, to the task of foreign policy. But for Pompeo, his worldview is informed by his faith. There's no separating the two. It's who he is. Your faith has informed your, your views clearly. And not only that, but you know, you, you're, you're not shy to, to talk about it. And, I, and I'm wondering about how that, how that really manifests uh, in, in your life. So of course my mission as a Secretary of State, the thing I rose my, raised my right hand to do, I swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I've done that now a handful of times, first as a soldier, uh, then as a member of Congress, then as the director of the CIA, now as Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. um, but in each of those missions, uh, the task that I have is informed by my understanding of my faith, uh, my belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior. I think that makes a real difference, and so I want people to know. It's why I talk about it from time to time. I want folks to know the perspective that I am bringing to uh, the challenges and the job that I face. And um, it also uh, requires me to try and hold myself to the standards uh, that Christians hold themselves out for. It's not an easy task. From North Korea to Iran and everything in between, he's the key man. But Pompeo, who loves Revolutionary War history, is determined to forge ahead in both the diplomatic and spiritual battlefields ahead. David Brody, CBN News. And you heard a critic there of Mike Pompeo saying, oh my, how horrible that somebody like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo might apply Christian values to foreign policy. Those are some of the things we've been talking about for the first part of Understanding the Times Radio, and that is President Trump has Christians, Christian-friendly people serving in the administration. The party of the left, and for that matter, the media, all sorts of movers and shakers, the deep state people in Washington are just simply horrified by the concept of God. They want to delete God from the country. They want to delete godly principles from the country. They want us to celebrate nothing but diversity, values that any Christian can only run from because they're fulfilling the Isaiah 5:20, good being called evil, evil being called good, and they're an indication that many in America and the Western world have been given over to a Romans 1 mentality, depravity, depravity. Talking to Bill Koenig for the hour, I'm not quite finished with the media yet, and you say this, CNN is a media disaster in their continued spewing of vitriol toward conservatives. I haven't seen Wolf Blitzer smile in 15 years. He's a big part of the problem, along with the other cast of characters. Homosexual TV personalities, Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon. Then you say, the other networks are equally bad in their distorted coverage of conservatives. MSNBC's top host, Rachel Maddow, is a lesbian. The LGBT agenda is one of their main agenda items. Joe Scarborough, Mika Brzezinski, along with their media guests, can't contain their angst against President Trump. And then you conclude, and I'm at least cutting it off here, Fox News is filling their ranks with gay personalities. Shepard Smith and Fox News 
contributor Guy Benson, our homosexual and Fox News contributor Tammy Bruce is a lesbian. Most members of the five personalities are on record as favoring same-sex marriage. Fox's Steve Hilton asked President Trump if he would have a problem with Democrat presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg being on stage with his husband. The president said he wouldn't mind. The LGBT activists are going to keep at this in an attempt to isolate the president from his Christian base. I thought that was a good quick summary, at least of some cable news. Yeah. Where is our perspective in that? Where is our Judeo-Christian values? Where is the respect or tolerance for our views? And that's unfortunately what has happened with these cable networks that you've mentioned. These people have made a determination on how they want to run their life. At the same time, they're not tolerant of our beliefs and our values. And they say we're not tolerant. Well, they're not tolerant of the way we believe, the way we were brought up, the Judeo-Christian values that dictate our lives. And that's a big problem, Jan. I mean, people have the right to have their own beliefs. Unfortunately, they don't have a personal, intimate relationship with Mm -hmm. our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's all we can pray for. There's nothing new under the sun, as as Solomon spoke of in Ecclesiastes. We're living in that Isaiah 520 time, when evil's considered good and good's considered evil. Things are out of order. They're out of order because we're moving away from our Judeo-Christian values and our foundation that built and created this wonderful country. Bill, I want to talk for just a minute here. You and I monitor events as they relate to the Bible, literally on a daily basis. Folks, you can read headlines on my website, olivetreeviews.org, headlines and articles that are posted daily that will help give you insight from a biblical perspective on the issues of the day. Same with Bill Koenig's website. Bill is my guest for the hour. His website is watch.org, and you can get his e-newsletter, Koenig's Eye View from the White House, to help you understand these times. But I went out of that segment, one saying, and you and I say all the time, we are in an age of the most significant breaking news, at least as it relates to the issues of the last days, with the least amount of interest in this topic. Give me your feedback on that and the fact that you and I have talked a lot about 100 million people in various churches believe in replacement theology. Talk to me about this for a minute. It amazes me that we literally are living in the most important time in biblical and prophetic history with the least amount of interest in the church. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, that's uh, in 2004, the Lord put my heart, go add up the numbers of all the people that attend Protestant and Catholic churches that are replacement theology, believing that there is no biblical significance to the state of Israel, that Jesus will be returning to Jerusalem for a thousand-year millennial reign, that they know nothing of the rapture, and they're the ones that are calling for Israel to leave the covenant land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. I'm amazed that this biblical illiteracy is like this today. And these are the ones with the World Council Churches, National Council Churches, that are calling on Israel to give up Arab land. The Arabs, their land. It's amazing to me, Jan. But again, the 27% of the Bible that's Bible prophecy, yeah. that's as important today as it's ever been because we're getting close to that day when the Messiah returns. Fortunately, we understand that. But you have all these people in direct opposition because they believe that Bible prophecy is allegorical, not literal. That's right. So that's consequently, right. if they're an heir there, they're going to be an heir in other parts of the Bible. I want my audience to hear just some of the scoffing that's going on out there. It's simply shocking. I'm talking now about issues related to end times, Israel, Jerusalem, because they're all tied together. This is a clip I found. I'm not even sure who it is. It's off of a YouTube video. But I just want you to listen to the tone of this, folks, and then put this into perspective of how important what Bill Koenig and I are talking about for this hour, some of the most important insight and perspective on our times, because it has everything to do with how quickly the Lord is coming back. And now listen to the scoffers. I've told you before about the evangelical support for Israel being very heavily driven by the belief that by supporting Israel, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ will happen. And depending on your flavor of Christianity, this will bring about the rapture or the apocalypse or the end times or the end of the world, whichever lovely phrase your sect attributes to that event. I've also told you before about outrageous Fox News host Janine Pirro who was at some point a judge somewhere, really scary to think about. And she combined her insanity with the evangelical insanity around Israel in one lovely segment where she praised Donald Trump's decision to move the embassy that the United States has in Israel from Tel Aviv to to Jerusalem as the fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. Listen to Janine Pirro here just gushing about how great Donald Trump is. 
Donald Trump sent Iranians who are the descendants of Persia a message to reflect on their own history. Right. And that it was the king of Persia who a thousand years before Mohammed was even born mm. that said Jerusalem was the capital of the Jewish people's country. Crucial. There will be no Ottoman empires or Shia nations that will destroy Jerusalem any longer. Donald Trump recognized history. He, like King Cyrus before him, Ugh. fulfilled the biblical prophecy Gag. of the gods worshipped by Jews, Christians, and, and yes, yes, Muslims, that <laughs> Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Jewish state and that the Jewish people finally deserve a righteous, free, and sovereign Israel. I noticed she has that same weird pronunciation of Jerusalem that Trump had in that video where it didn't, it wasn't clear whether he was trying to eat his tongue or maybe had a denture issue. I wonder if maybe it's like having veneers that are too big or something like that. Crucial. It's a weird. Did you notice that, Pat? Yeah. It's a weird thing that's going on. Maybe there. it's connected to being a Trump supporter in some way. I although don't know. it would be hard to draw that line. Exactly. Yeah, hard to hard to parse it out. How is this news? Like, how does this count as news analysis? These are quite literally the rantings of a disjointed and ignorant person. And I wonder, like, do, do they know that this is the biblical prophecy that ends with the destruction of life or the rapture? I know some of them know that and love it. Like they think that's just that's the greatest thing. Nothing better than the rapture. But I think that that's part of the story that some of these people are missing. And, and the other just laughable thing that shows you how transparently devoid of any meaning all of this nonsense is, is that in reality, the relocation of an embassy doesn't have anything to do with biblical prophecy, right? Like Jerusalem as the real and enduring capital of Israel either is or is not. But a nearly obese 71 year old president saying that we're moving a building from one city to another, that doesn't materially change the biblical meaning of what's going on. And that's what's sort of truly beneath evangelical support for Israel. It's this nonsense where more than 50 percent of American evangelical Christians believe literally that Israel is a requirement for the rapture or Armageddon or the apocalypse. Call it what you want. The end of the world. They want that, right? And they see Jerusalem as ground zero for that. And it is really important to understand this. When you hear about the political support that Israel gets from the right. Bill Koenig, Second Peter 3, screams at me about the mocking and the scoffing going on. I'm sure it does you as well. Those guys are so clueless. Where do you begin? Yeah, where do you begin? Uh, I know. It, but they're it, indicative it just, of what's out there. Oh, it's a great example, Jan. And uh, no connection of the dots. Their level of understanding is so inadequate. You know, unfortunately, there are just a small amount of us that are truly right. tuned in evangelicals. That's why I just praise God for the opportunity to understand from Genesis to Revelation is His Word, and for us to follow the Word from beginning to end. And the prophecy is as relevant today as it's ever been. And it excites me to see God moving in my life and other people's lives and answered prayers, and then to watch Bible prophecy playing out in our day. It's incredibly exciting. And the time clock is Jerusalem in the state of Israel, mm -hmm. and it's exciting days. You have written a lot about, and one of your books is Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. And recently in your e-newsletter and other places, I've heard you comment and watch you comment and read things. We have had just astounding May and early parts of June here, astounding, I would say, weather catastrophes. We've had, I think, 500 tornadoes in just a few weeks. That was back in May. It's sort of one calamity after another. And you feel that some of these calamities have come about because America is messing with God's covenant land, possibly with Jared Kushner trying to divide the land. At the same time, you and I acknowledge Israel's never had a friend like Donald Trump. So how are you connecting the dots here? We've got Jared Kushner maybe trying to divide the land. Donald Trump, who's not going to let anything harmful happen to Israel. Well, it all gets back to the importance of that land, regardless of friend or foe. God gave that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, and it's not to be divided, parted, parceled, whatever. It's his covenant land. And I've documented 129 events since the mm. perfect storm was sending 30-foot waves into President Bush's home in Madrid, Spain, in October 30 of 1991. I've noticed in my studies and history of documenting all these events, when we've had Midwestern floods, that's been the period of the most active effort in the peace process. Mm -hmm. There's been five different summers over the last 27 years that there has been massive flooding. And at the very time, our White House administrations were very active in the peace process 
at that time. This last month, the month of May had 500 tornadoes, mm-hmm. record floods, record storms, and Kushner was very active. He was in Jerusalem. He was in Brussels. He was having meetings with Middle East leaders in preparation for the January 25-26 conference in Bahrain. So his whole month of May was very active. They acknowledged the date. They invited everybody. He had these key meetings with NATO leaders, Israeli leaders, Middle East leaders, and all of this was taking place in the heartland of America as the heartland of Israel is being discussed. Well, very interesting. And yet, as I said, and I emphasize and reemphasize, I cannot fathom the president allowing anything to happen that's going to harm the nation of Israel, her boundaries, her borders, her people. I could be very wrong, but I just have a hard time seeing that happen. No, I agree with that. I definitely agree. And that's what your good friend, Michelle Bachman, and mm-hmm. others, you know, we've contacted the White House. You've yes, addressed I one know of your you programs. have. We've been involved. They're aware of what we're saying. They're aware of the message. They're aware of the importance of the covenant land of Israel from a biblical perspective. So the Lord has definitely opened those doors for Michelle, myself, thanks to Michelle, to be able to get this message to the administration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think they are very well aware of it. Partially, it's interesting, is they were going to do the economic and political at the same time, the political being the land, and they decided to kind of break it into two parts, starting with the economic and the political has been delayed again because there is not a government in Israel, so that possibly will be November. But we continue to say, please do not give up the biblical heartland of Israel, which Judea and Samaria, for an Arab state. Please do not, because there will be consequences, as there have been since 1991, and even before that. I want to hit Iran, too, here before our time runs out. But before I head in that direction, just give me your perspective on the candidates on the left for the 2020 election, because obviously campaign 2020 is in full gear. President Trump kicked his off a week or so ago. The left has been on the march here for six months, practically. Give me your thoughts. Not a lot of substance. There's a lot of stuff that they say, Warren and Mm -hmm. Harris and Booker and others, Biden. They have their rhetoric that plays to their base, but there's just not a lot of gravitas. There's not a lot of plans. All they can do is attack Trump. You know, Jan, the 20-plus candidates, I don't think there's really anybody that's even formidable. I think it's going to be a very interesting election, obviously, with all the different components and attacks the president's gone under and Vice President Pence. That's my opinion at this point. There really isn't a real strong, viable Democratic candidate. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here talking to White House correspondent Bill Koenig. You hear him on this program many times. We try to bring Washington insights to all of you, and we've had Michelle Bachman on numerous times as well, and we kind of are a one, two, three punch when it comes to trying to keep you apprised of all that's going on in our nation's capital. But more than importantly than that, how does it tie in to the Bible? How does it tie into events that are predicted in the Bible for the last days? Remember, if you write to us, would you always tell us how you listen? You listen to our, one of our over 850 stations, podcasts, YouTube. We're slipping some images and video into our YouTube now. If you'd like to actually see what we're talking about, you can do that on our YouTube. If you're really in a hurry and you just want it downloaded to your devices, get our oneplace.com mobile app and you can take the program with you wherever you go. I hear from a lot of you saying you take your morning walk and listen to Understanding the Times Radio, and we really appreciate it. Why don't you check out our print and e-newsletter where we talk about all the things Bill Koenig and I are discussing on this particular hour. Bill, I want to play a real quick clip. It's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo talking about a potential war with Iran. And then I want to spend at least five minutes or longer if necessary talking to you about what on earth is going on with Israel and Iran, America and Iran. Is this a war we're looking at? Is this possibly even Gog Magog forming? Uh, The United States is considering a full range of options. We've briefed the president a couple of times. We'll continue to keep him updated. Uh, We are confident that we can take a set of actions that can restore deterrence, which is our mission set. You say a full range of options. Does that include a military response? Of course. Of course, the president will consider uh, everything we need to do to make sure, right? But what's the president said, we don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon. The previous administration put them on a pathway that virtually guaranteed that they could get there. So we withdrew from the ridiculous JCPOA and are moving ourselves towards a set of policies which will convince Iran to behave simply like a normal nation. And so you've seen them uh, attacking international waterways, trying to, frankly, drive up the price of crude oil around the world so that the world will cry uncle and why allow Iran to... Why would they do that? If they're so cash-strapped and they need these customers, why would they attack them? 
Because Iran can't sell its crude oil. We've stopped them from doing that. We've put sanctions in place that have taken them from roughly 2.7 barrels per day, million barrels per day, with American sanctions. CENTCOM released this video of uh, purporting to show an IRGC Revolutionary Guard patrol boat pulling up a, a, alongside these vessels and removing a mine from the hull of the ship. Um, how certain are you that this is the IRGC, and will you take that evidence and present it to our allies and the United Nations? Uh, of course we will. When? And, and, and we don't just purport. That's what that video is. <laughs> Uh, this was this was taken from an American camera. This is the stop. This is the real data. Yes, we've shared it with allies already. Uh, you've had the chance to see it. Uh, I made uh, a bunch of phone calls yesterday. I make a whole bunch more calls today. The world needs to unite against this threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Bill Koenig, the previous administration actually enabled Iran to get the bomb. Current administration is trying to prevent Iran from getting the bomb, though news reports say they're going to have it in six months. Are we looking at a potential war, either Israel striking Iran, America striking Iran, Iran striking Israel, Iran striking America? What are your thoughts? Well, the region's tense. The good thing about it, President Trump has people in place right now that fully understand the number one threat to the Middle East, possibly the world, is Iran. You have Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, who's a remarkable Secretary of State, who also has the benefit of the CIA insight that uh, he had when he was director of the CIA. And then you have John Bolton, yes. who's been mm -hmm. staunch about Iran and the threats of Iran and North Korea for a long period of time. So you have very practical, pragmatic people that fully understand the threat. The other thing is a former CIA 28-year person told me about five, six years ago at the UN, it's not by chance that the Chinese, Persians, and Jews have survived the centuries because they're that smart. So this is a very formidable group. I mean, they're three-dimensional chess players when anybody else in the Middle East is playing checkers. Mm -hmm. So Iran is a very substantial threat, Jan. We have to take them very serious. At the same time, we know what their nefarious purposes are for the Middle East. We can see that they're still a major supporter of the terror group Hezbollah Hamas, the Houthis in Yemen. They're also working their way into South America. I mean, they are very formidable. Number one is stopping the nuclear weapon. Number two is stopping the ballistic missiles that can carry those nuclear weapons, calling them to become a player in the nations of the world. As you know, that they're very 12th imam focused exactly. prophetic people, so it'd probably never get there. But nonetheless, this Trump administration is very serious about applying the pressure on Iran to stop some of these nefarious things mm. that they're doing. Well, Israel had a plan to attack Iran back in about 2008. Then the Obama administration came along. I'll never forget this. It's just stunning. Forbade Israel from attacking Iran. So I guess he could protect his Muslim buddies. He just said, Israel, if you try to attack Iran, Iranian nuclear reactors, our U.S. planes will shoot your planes out of the sky. I'm sure you about fell out of your chair when you read that too, Bill. Absolutely. It's October 2008. Israel's about ready to just turn their jets on and go. White House caught wind of it. Obama said, look, if you don't do this, we will promise you we will start pushing for sanctions right after the election in 2009. And Netanyahu was all but ready to go and were stopped by Obama at that point, and then it ended up working this way into this agreement that the Trump administration is not favoring. Wouldn't now be the time? Now Israel has the most friendly U.S. president in its 71-year history. Israel has the needed weaponry. At the same time, it would not be like the 1981 strike on the Iraqi nuclear reactor. Wouldn't now be sort of the ideal time for Israel to do this, to make some kind of a strike? Yes, for two reasons. Number one is the situation with the Hezbollah on their northern border is getting much worse. Mm -hmm. Number two is Iran is developing some weaponry in Lebanon. They're also bringing it in. Israel continues to take out with aircraft. That continues to be an issue and a problem. They also bought a lot of stealth jets from us. They can give them a lot of different capabilities that they didn't have before. Their 2008 plan was brilliant. It was all kinds of things. Cyber, localized EMP, right. bringing jets in from Kyrgyzstan. And you have an administration right now. Two things. This administration could benefit a lot with what Israel's already done in preparation for that inevitable attack on Iran. Very likely the fulfillment of Jeremiah 49, 35 through sure. 39 that speaks of Elam, which is modern day Iran. So this would be a formidable Israel-United States cooperation in the event to deal with this enemy 
that the leadership of Iran continues to talk about the wiping out of the little Satan, which is Israel, and the big Satan, which is the United States. They are bent on determined to wipe out Israel, and no one knows it better than Israel, and they must do something as well. And one other quick note here, Jan, the Saudis are petrified of a nuclear Iran because they believe Israel would be the first to be hit, and they would be the second to be hit, and they need to be prepared as well. And that's another reason the Saudis are looking to the United States and Israel to be assistance to them. Well, and Iran is waiting for the Mahdi. You called him the 12th Imam, same thing, the Mahdi. Islamic Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah, and I think they believe that chaos will welcome the Mahdi, so I think they'd love to create chaos, which is unthinkable, Bill, if you're thinking of nuclear weaponry dropped on innocent people just to bring in their Mahdi, but these people are capable of doing that. Yeah, that was the big talk, Jan, during Obama's time in office, the 12th Imam of the Mahdi. You know, we haven't heard a lot about it lately, but we know that the supreme leaders of Iran are very prophetic when it comes to that, which you just discussed. And I would imagine it's as much so than ever before. They just aren't addressing it or mentioning that. Only the God of Israel knows how things are going to play out in the Middle East. But fortunately for the United States, we have a team in place as well as at the Pentagon that fully understands the number one threat to the Middle East and to the world, actually, the nation of Iran. If you'd like to learn more, folks, visit Bill's website, watch.org. Sign up for his Koenig's Eye View from the White House e-newsletter. He's got two books he's offering over there, Obama's Legacy and Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. And as I go out of the program, I feel I need to remind us, yeah, we live in unstable times. We live in biblical times. Frankly, we live in times that the prophets of old longed to see, but it is both a privilege and a challenge to be born for such a time as this. So many I hear from are walking through a fire. Many of you listening today are walking through a fire. And it seems the world is always engulfed in turmoil as well. Let me leave you with the verse from Psalm 30. 